Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending the Wall Street Journal Future Leaders webinar in conversation with the HKUST Business School. I'm Yumiko Ono, and I'm an editor with the Wall Street Journal based in Singapore. Today, we'll be covering a very hot topic that I'm sure is on everybody's minds, which is Asia's economic outlook. Is it still resilient? What are the chase challenges facing Asia, and how will it fare? There's a long list of questions that we all have to be thinking about as challenges. There's the inflation, rising interest rates, there's the war in Ukraine, there's the US banking turmoil, the unraveling of the US-China relations. Everyone is looking at China to see how strong the recovery is after the post-COVID opening, but the answer is not so clear at the moment. Before we go on to introduce the panelists, I wanna just go over a few housekeeping rules. This session will be recorded for those of you who could not make it or for those of you who wanna watch it again. And if you could please submit your questions if you have any in the Q&A box. Now, a lot of people from all over the world have already submitted a lot of questions and that is great. Thank you so much for doing that. But if you have any additional questions based on our discussion, please put that in the Q&A box and we will get to this uh, at the very end. So I want to introduce you to the panelists today. Uh, we have Professor Albert Park. He's the Chief Economist of the Asian Development Bank and also the Chair Professor of Economics, Social Science and Public Policy on leave from HKUST. He's a development and labor economist who is an expert on China's economic development. We also have Jason Douglas. He's a reporter for the Wall Street Journal based in Singapore. He writes about trends and developments in the economies in the Asia region, and before, uh, including China. Before Singapore, he was in London covering COVID and Brexit. So I would like to kick off by asking each of the panelists a quick personal anecdote related to Asia's economy. Um, I'll start to give an example. I'm from Japan, so I cannot believe that the stock market in Japan is at the highest level since 1990. That's 33 years. I mean, 33 years ago, we still had TDK cassette tapes, you know, and um, George H.W. Bush was president and I was very young. But here we are 33 years later. I mean, what is going on with it? Why is the Japanese economy so hot? So that is something I would like to ask uh, both of you later. Um, Albert, what kind of uh, example do you have? Well, uh, since I became the chief economist uh, at ADB, I've been trying to travel around the region. And uh, I've been chief economist for about a year and a half now. And last year, when I tried to travel to countries, there were still lots of covid testing requirements. I remember in India, I had to go to some private medical clinic with people escorting me in and out to get a COVID test in time for me to be able to depart and get to my next destination. Similarly, in Korea and other countries and China, I didn't even dare go to. And then this year, I've been traveling to some of the same places, and it's been just completely smooth. And it just has reminded me that things continue to open up. And I think we're seeing that in our own projections for continued recovery in Asia. And when I was in China last week, you know, mm -hmm. the restaurants were bustling, subways were full. So it really felt uh, quite normal. Wow. So things really are opening up that you can see in your own example. Thank you, Albert. Jason, how about you? Uh, so I probably saw... really notice it most with that. Uh traveling and I was in Japan recently and I had to spend two and a half hours at immigration because there were so many people uh, arriving wow. for a holiday and so few uh, border guards to process us all. Um, that was an instance where I had, uh, in a rare display of financial acumen, had bought uh, a ticket at the end of last year when the yen tanked. Uh, so I felt <laughs> quite pleased with myself. I guess the other place in is in Singapore where everyone gets extremely excited if uh, uh, the uh, food stalls raise their prices for uh, things like chicken rice too much. Uh, <laughs> people get uh, extremely upset. Okay, so inflation in the chicken rice. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we'd like to start off the discussion by talking about the Chinese economy. Um, everybody's looking at China. There's been a strong opening, uh, uh, a sudden opening after COVID. Uh, there seems to be a comeback, but some of the 
numbers recently weren't so good. So what is going on here? Albert, I'll start with you. What is your take on the Chinese economy at the moment? I would characterize Chinese uh, recovery this year as sluggish. You know, before uh, China reversed its zero COVID policy uh, last year, we were projecting that China would grow at something like 4.2, 4.3% this year. And then after the COVID policy was reversed, we updated our forecast uh, earlier this uh, year in April to 5%, which coincidentally mm -hmm. is the same as the Chinese government's own projections. Um, and even though we're seeing a uh, slowdown, we're still seeing kind of elevated unemployment rates. We're still seeing kind of a slow recovery in uh, incomes and spending, in, especially in some categories. We're seeing a gradual recovery of Chinese tourists leaving China and hitting other destinations. Despite all of that, we're probably going to continue upgrading our growth projections for China on the strength of the strong first quarter growth, which was well above expectations and a feeling that kind of there's still room for recovery for the Chinese consumer, despite all of the sluggishness. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it, uh, you know, there are a lot of challenges. I think Chinese consumers have not regained their confidence fully. We're also seeing that in sluggish recovery in the property market. But uh, if things do continue to get better, which we expect, and the, you know, the rest of the region is also growing fairly robustly, then we still expect the Chinese consumer to come back uh, gradually, if not uh, all at once. Okay, all right. Now you mentioned the Chinese consumer and Jason, I want to go to you. Why is the Chinese consumer in a more important position at the moment? Okay, so, well, when China, you know, when China is sort of driving the global economy where China has staged these big recoveries of the past, it's usually been driven by, not by consumption, but by investment. Uh, so China will, you know, suck in commodities from all over the world and machinery from all over the world, uh, usually to drive a, a, you know, a sort of investment-led uh, growth spurt. Um, it's very mm -hmm. different this time. Um, exports, another engine of the Chinese economy, aren't doing very well because growth is slowing elsewhere. Uh, investment is down primarily because, as um, Albert mentioned, the real estate sector isn't do doing well either. And so that really only leaves consumption to drive uh, recovery in China. And so, yes, while the signs so far look OK, there's still, I think, a big question mark over just how durable this re this recovery and consumption will be and whether Chinese consumers are, are really able to power the Chinese economy this year. Mm. Uh, we can see that in things like very still very high household savings. Um, Albert mentioned uh, the jobs as well. That's particularly acute in, the, in youth unemployment, which is something that, like something like 20 percent at the moment, if I remember correctly. That's really high. Um, it is, and it's. I mean, there will be a cyclical element in that, probably quite a big one. But I think the worry for Chinese policymakers and others is: is there also a, some sort of structural problem here? Are we producing? Are we producing the right jobs for all these people entering the labour market? So, um, yeah, there's there, there are big base effects. The Chinese economy should do fine this year, uh, you know. But after that, I think there are lots of big questions come back to come back to the fore. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you mentioned tourists, both of you mentioned tourists, and Jason, you wrote a story recently about the Chinese tourists. Now, I thought they they were traveling all over the place, and there was strong um, numbers for the, the beginning of May. What happened? So I lost you a little bit there. If you're asking about Chinese tourism, I mean, the recovery is starting. It's not, I mean, they're still way down in where they were uh, pre-pandemic. Mm. Um, China, Chinese tourists were the biggest spending group um, it, before the pandemic in 2019. Um, so they are starting to go back. It looks like, it's a bit like the broader consumption recovery in China, right? So that's being led by rich people or but by well-off people whose incomes didn't suffer too much during the during the lockdowns and so on, the same people that did, the, you know, that uh, led led recoveries in other parts of the world. Those of us who didn't necessarily lose income during the pandemic, those are the people who are now venturing overseas again uh, from China. Uh, and what we haven't seen yet is the the big kind of middle class following them, if you like. Mm. Um, just on the one final thought on the on the on the uh, travel thing is there's still a lot of supply bottlenecks, so we don't have enough flights. There are long delays getting passports and visas all of which we saw uh, with every other country that reopened after the pandemic. So China, the, the recovery in tourism is kind of slow, but so is everyone's really. So there's still a chance that tourism included 
might recover a bit more if these bottlenecks are removed? I think so. And you're seeing, you know, more and more flights are opening up and uh, mm -hmm. the numbers keep going in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Okay. All right. Albert, um, when we talk about the Chinese economy, we have to talk about the the heightening tensions between China and the U.S. And what kind of a, you know, there, there are new things going on all the time. There's the um, U.S. restricting things from China. There's China restricting um, products from the U.S. There's China's um, espionage law and getting tougher on Western companies. How much do all of these things impact the Chinese economic growth? Well, I think the first point to say, I mean, from the standpoint of an economist, is that all of these barriers to trade either way hurt both sides, hurt everybody in some aggregate sense, because they start to unravel what have become extremely efficient supply chain relationships that link China and the U.S. and many other economies in the world. Um, I think China, obviously, the most sensitive area right now is in the high tech competition, which is the focus of U.S., kind of uh, technology export restrictions. And obviously China is trying to counter that with aggressive investment and support to become more um, capable. And then ironically, we see the US doing the opposite. They are trying to gonna build up manufacturing cap capability and chips, which is not something they've ever really, uh, you know, been uh, as specialized in uh, before. Uh, and so you can just see kind of the inefficiency of this for both sides, and it'll be costly, uh, I think, to some extent uh, to both sides. That said, one thing that helps China, I think, in this context is that it's still very much connected to supply chains in the region. So within uh, Asia, China's share of intermediate uh, imports has increased quite steadily over the pandemic years. Um, the area where we see the greatest weakness is foreign direct investment into China, which has fallen, especially greenfield FDI projects. And of course, some of that could be could have been due to the fact that uh, China was closed. It was hard to go visit and mm -hmm. close these physical plant deals. So I think uh, now that China has reopened to see whether and to what extent that recovers will be kind of a litmus test to see whether uh, that decline during the pandemic is a structural shift related to these uh, uh, geopolitical pressures or whether, you know, the attractiveness of the China market will still will bring back the FDI back into China. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And as you're from your your job looking at the whole region in Asia, um, what does it mean, this U.S.-China heightening tensions for the countries around China? Is it an opportunity for them because maybe the U.S. would want to or other com um, Western companies might want to diversify away from China and make things in their country? Or is it actually not such a good thing? Uh, it, it can be a good thing. Uh, it depends mm -hmm. on how this uh, is kind of implemented. So, you know, if two large countries have a trade war, uh, whether it be U.S., China, or the West and Russia, and they have sanctions, then for third-party countries, it provides opportunities to export to either side, actually. And so you see, right. uh, you know, countries like Vietnam, in particular, gaining a lot of new FDI as uh, both both Western and Chinese companies feel that this is a place where they can kind of not be subject to sanctions if they invest there and export from that location. On the other hand, if uh, third party countries are asked to really choose sides and to truly decouple, there have been a number of uh, trade studies which suggest that um, if you force, let's say, a Vietnam or a Philippines saying, oh, you have to trade with us and not with China, or you have to trade with China and not with US, you have to pick one side. Mm -hmm. that it turns out that the large countries, China and the U.S., are not actually hurt all that much because they have large domestic economies. They have diverse uh, set of uh, trade relationships with many countries around the world, so they can kind of absorb specific shocks. It's the small countries themselves that trade with both China and the U.S. If they're forced to choose, they are really hurt. Uh, oh. They're really, really negatively affected. 
Um, and that's why I think you're you're seeing most of these countries very resistant to being forced to pick sides. Uh, and they'll go to great lengths diplomatically to avoid that. And if they're ultimately forced to do so, I think they will be, uh, you know, materially uh, harmed. So hopefully we can avoid it getting to that point. I don't think it's really happened so much. I think most of the outreach, uh, you know, the engagement in terms of China being part of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, which is an integrating force, uh, and the U.S. trying to reach out to countries through its IPEF, you know, Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. Economic Forum. They're mostly positive uh, kind of um, uh, efforts to uh, promote integration. As long as it stays that way, I think, um, you know, that's beneficial and it will it will reduce the harms kind of uh, the global harms imposed by, uh, you know, U.S.-China trade tension. OK, OK. I mean, we think of and Jason, I'm, I'm going to go to you next where we we hear about things like China plus one or de-risking, you know, I guess it's not decoupling anymore. They call it de-risking or de-risking is a smaller um, uh, version of decoupling, but it sounds like a good thing for the countries around um, China that might get more business. Well, as Albert says, it can be. I mean, the just going back to the point on investment in China, I mean, the, the distinction between greenfield investment and reinvesting in existing operations is, I think, an important one. You know, it just seems very hard to imagine in this in the world we're currently living in that some large multinational would make lots of brand new investments in China or companies would necessarily want to go there having mm -hmm. never been there before. So I think the FDI we're going to see into China will almost certainly be people maintaining their domestic operations in China for the China market, which then, as you say, does leave some investment opportunities for other countries, uh, mostly in Asia. The, um, you know, the big difficulty is China is still plugged into these supply chains, no matter what you do, right? I mean, they're uh, in terms of making components and uh, intermediate goods and all that kind of stuff. It's just very difficult to get China out of these supply chains uh, entirely, assuming that is your kind of economic objective in the end. So, I mean, certainly in the short term, it seems that the, what we have seen in the data since the trade war began in 2017 is an increase. So the other Southeast Asian economies, for instance, have seen an increase in trade with the United States and an increase in trade with China. Mm -hmm. um, so for the moment, these bystander economies, as they're sometimes called, seem to be doing OK. But as Albert says, that isn't necessarily going to be true forever. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So at the moment, they many of them seem to be um, you know, making the most of the opportunities that are there for an eye. Okay, all right, but it could not. It could be. It could come back to hurt them as well. Is what you're saying? Okay, great. Now, Jason, um, let's talk about inflation and central banks. Since you mentioned the chicken rice um, price yes. hike in the yes. Singapore Hawker Centers, now the central banks in Asia seem to be signaling that. They've raised interest rates enough, or it will soon be enough. But on the other hand, the Fed and ECB are sort of not quite saying that at the moment. So what's behind this divergence and what does that mean for Asia's economies? Okay, so the, the simplest explanation, I think, is their domestic conditions. Inflation is pretty much in retreat across most of Asia. It's getting mm -hmm. back down to the levels that central banks are much more comfortable with. There are a few exceptions, places like Pakistan and Sri Lanka and so on, but in most places it's below five now. In many countries, it's now back down to two or three, which central banks are much happier with. So I think every central bank has now paused and has been on pause for a couple of months. Uh, Vietnam has started to cut. Um, and I think uh, some economists expect places like Korea and possibly Taiwan to be not, not too far um, behind them. So it's really a mixture of cooling inflation and, uh, you know, just a different growth outlook. I think for the export oriented economies, the, the, the sort of immediate pressures are probably a little bit more severe. Severe isn't the right word. They're probably a little bit more intense. But we are still seeing in lots of economies pretty strong domestic demand, um, which is making the trade off between growth and inflation a lot more comfortable for central banks, um, whereas it's still a bit trickier. And advanced economies like the United States, where although inflation has started to come down, it's still nowhere near where he wants to be. Same in Europe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, what about uh, Albert going to you next? The chances of a recession. Uh, this is actually a question from the audience. And I actually invite uh, people from the audience to submit 
Any other questions they have into the Q&A box? Um, what are the chances of recession in Asia? And what are some of the scenarios? I mean, what? how could that play out? Well, first of all, I want to compliment Jason on inventing a new price index, the chicken rice price index. <laughs> I think it might, may revival, rev, rival the Big Mac price index that the economist <laughs> popularized earlier. So that's very exciting. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't think there's much risk of recession in Asia. I mean, our growth forecasts for the region are 4.8% this year and 4.8% next for year. For the whole region. Okay. For, for developing that doesn't sound Asia like recession. No, in fact, it leaves quite a lot of buffer from going to negative growth rates uh, broadly. And the big economies, China and India, you know, are going to post solid growth rates this year. It would be hard to imagine um, them falling falling to recession uh, levels. Uh, and, and really what's driving that is, uh, you know, as Jason said, uh, recovering demand, really recovery from the pandemic still, because, you know, unlike in the Western countries where the governments had huge stimulus packages, which really boosted demand quickly, uh, in Asia, the stimulus has been much more modest. So the recovery in demand has been more gradual. And so we've we saw, uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic last year, some recovery, but now it continues as uh, as as demand is restored and uh, and incomes are get back to normal. And so we kind of view this as the region putting the pandemic behind it to some extent, although, you know, four point eight percent growth is still lower than the growth rates we were seeing before the pandemic. But given mm -hmm. The fact that, you know, the global kind of environment is still quite challenging with very low growth in advanced countries. So there's mm -hmm. very little export uh, kind of driven stimulus for growth. It's really m mostly on on the strength of recovering domestic demand. Uh, so we're we're quite optimistic. Now, the some of the kind of risk scenarios for yeah. the region are, uh, you know, the banking turmoil we're seeing in the U.S., which seems to be like a slow moving crisis that was also a characteristic of the great financial crisis. I don't mm -hmm. think we're out of the woods yet. And then also, as Danny said, I'm sorry, as uh, D Jason said, Jason. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, I think the U S fed, um, if it really wants to reach target inflation in the U S it would probably have to be more aggressive and in it's interest rate high tech some, at some point, although this is being again tempered by not wanting to exacerbate the banking uh, instability by raising interest rates too high, mm -hmm. um, but all of those have uh, carry financial risks for the region. They because it, you know any kind of a, a sudden change scenario will really lead to credit shortage, uh, liquidity, you know, drying. We're already seeing it in response to the banking turmoil to some extent. And okay. this creates pressure, especially on the countries in the region that are struggling with debt sustainability or where there's kind of not as much confidence in the macroeconomic management of these economies. Mm. So we're seeing okay. that in uh, Laos and Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Okay. Okay. So Laos, Pakistan, Sri Lanka might be the kinds of places where there's more risk than the rest of the region, as you say. Okay. We have a... Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about which countries stand out as ones to watch, not really for the risks, but for the opportunities or for, you know, that might be an engine of growth. And we have a question from the audience, and I want to take it to you, Jason. Um, is Japan now about to enter a new growth phase? And if so, how has this happened? Why is Japan in the spotlight at the moment? Um. That is a good question, and there's certainly a lot of attention on it. You mentioned at the beginning of the stock market is at its highest level since uh, in 30 years or something. Mm -hmm. At least part of that we must attribute to a gentleman called Warren Buffett, who has heavily <laughs> invested in Japan or revealed he was heavily invested in Japan mm -hmm. um, recently. But it does. There is something happening, right? I mean, the um, we we talked a moment ago about um, uh, spillovers from kind of the U.S. China tech war and that kind of thing, and we are in this world of this new world of robust or muscular industrial policy by these big economic blocks like the United States, the EU and China. And there is kind of an interesting question around who is going to really lose out to that and who is going to benefit from it. And so far, Japan seems to be a country that is navigating this pretty well. 
it is, seems to be attracting a lot of investment from semiconductor firms uh, for a bunch of reasons, because they have a big semiconductor industry to begin with. They have a huge home market for all these products, um, and they are uh, not China. Un-China is, I think, one of the phrases mm -hmm. that's sort of floating around in, in kind of uh, market circles about uh, Japan. Um, there's a new central bank governor. There's some expectation of a change in policy there. We are starting to see some possible glimmers of hope on inflation um, uh, and, and the growth in the first quarter was pretty good. So, and also the final thing we should say is it's still a very low base of expectations for Japan, right? They've had this moribund economy for so long that even the slightest uh, improvement in things gets people very excited. Having said all that, I mean, it does, it, it is an interesting it is more interesting that it's been for a while, if that's not really uh, um, an unfair thing to say about such a fantastic country. Um, whether we really are on the cusp of a big change in its domestic economy, I think is still a pretty open question. Um, mm -hmm. Will Japan finally get out of deflation is, I think, a very open question. And how exactly Ueda can manage this is, is still not very clear. But certainly in terms of the terms of attracting investment and, uh, you know, taking a, a strong position in this kind of new global order, Japan is doing very well. Well, from moribund to un-China seems to be a big, big uh, change. And I think uh, Warren Buffett said last month that he owns more stocks in Japan than anywhere else in the world. Uh, that was as of last month, um, as it said in a Wall Street Journal story. So, uh, well, we, we shall see. But Japan is definitely more in the spotlight than before. How about another country, Albert, going to you next, um, India. The UN says India's population has surpassed that of China's. The Western companies that want to back up to China in manufacturing, as we just discussed, Apple's going into China big time. Are is China is finally going to become a manufacturing rival to China? I think it'll still take some work to rival China in manufacturing. I don't <laughs> think anyone has ever rivaled what China has accomplished. Uh, that said, uh, you know, we expect South Asia to be the highest growing region of Asia <laughs> this year and next. And India's growth rate, we are projecting to be 6.4% this year, 6.7% next year. Those are a little bit lower than earlier projections mainly because India has faced also some challenges with inflation, dealing with inflation, which has led to a slightly lost kind of uh, sentiment by consumers and investors. But still, the domestic uh, demand is driving growth in India. We have a government which is doing a lot of, uh, adopting a lot of pro-growth policies in terms of building infrastructure. India, you can add to the list of countries with uh, robust uh, industrial policies trying to support uh, targeted sectors. By the way, I don't think that's a great trend for the global economy. I think everybody's going to lose to some extent by competing uh, industrial policies that uh, some of them have kind of protectionist elements embedded in them. Mm -hmm. uh, one concern I have about India is that it's still kind of, there's a lot of discussions in India about, uh, about import liberalization where there's still kind of a protectionist sentiment of a lot of the policy debates. And we've seen actually tariff rates in India actually click up slightly in recent mm -hmm. years. And if you look at the Chinese, I mean, doing the China comparison, you know, one of the things that China really did do is it really did liberalize uh, tariffs on really most imports to very low levels. And research has found that, you know, imported inputs into China really uh, played an important role in raising the quality of Chinese products, raising the productivity of Chinese firms. And you really need to uh, liberalize both imports and exports to really uh, be competitive in these global value chains, right? You have to be part of these chains. And so taxing on either side really can can inhibit that. And that's just still, I think, a challenge um, uh, for India. India also has some longer term challenges related to uh, the quality of human capital, the mm -hmm. education, uh, the learning outcomes of children are still relatively poor, especially compared to uh, what China did. In India, they their uh, you know target growth rate is eight percent. They want to get to eight percent or higher. They're still a bit below that, at least this year and next. And I still think they need to make progress on uh, economic reform. 
uh, to get there. Uh, I, 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 I note the 8% number is an interesting one because China for many, many years said, we have to grow at higher than 8% to create <laughs> enough jobs to avoid, to employ all of the new uh, workers. So uh, in India, that number comes from kind of projecting out what growth rate they need to become like a developed economy by the 100 year mm. anniversary of India's oh, independence. Oh, I see. Calculated I see. Okay. Average. So somehow okay. this 8% number becomes focal. Yeah, for both China and India. Now, there were a lot of questions from the audience about India. So, Albert, I'll, I'll ask you another one. Uh, you just mentioned the imports and exports and exports and some of the protectionist sentiment that's still there in India. How how likely do you think it is that India actually realizes this and is trying to do something about it or change is coming soon? Or is that actually harder than, you know, it's easy to say, but harder to implement? I think it's a bit hard to say. Uh, for, take another example. Uh, India has not joined the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement. That was a conscious decision. India has not joined kind of the trade track of the Indo-Pacific uh, economic mm -hmm. framework. So it's a little bit resistance to be uh, forced to do too much. And you know, I think it wants to move at its own pace. That said, when I was in India, there was certainly discussion that uh, there's, you know, many people in India who would like to see, including in government circles, would like to see India eventually join those agreements. I kind of feel maybe the the, the trend is towards thinking about uh, uh, moving towards more open trade, but I think uh, it's a little bit more wait and see. I think they want to fi find more evidence that, you know, they're 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 developing successful competitive industries before they kind of open up things. I think they've had a bad experience with the mobile phone market when they kind of open it up and a lot of uh, a lot of related uh, industries, you know, didn't do so well when mm. when it was. So I think it's a cautious, but I think uh, I think moving still in the right direction. Mm -hmm, hopefully, mm -hmm. okay. But it didn't doesn't sound like they're about to. They're on the cusp of changing the somewhat protectionist um, uh, policies that they have. Not, not on the immediate horizon, I would mm -hmm. say. Okay, okay. All right. We have um, a couple of audience questions um, and uh, which from both from before and now about the dollar. So Jason, I wanna go to you next. There's a lot of chatter about de-dollarization or moving away from the US dollar as the world's reserve currency, where do things stand? Where do you see things uh, going? Well, I mean, the dollar is still the world's preeminent reserve currency, and um, it's hard to see that changing uh, anytime soon. I mean, the mm -hmm. you know, the uh, lots of things happen at the margin. Um, uh, we've had things like uh, Saudi Arabia agreeing to invoice oil purchases by China in yuan. Russia has agreed to buy. Uh, to I beg your pardon, agree to sell to take yuan in exchange for oil and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but these are, I mean, you know, Russia doesn't have any dollars; it doesn't have access to dollars. Um, Saudi Arabia still does most of its trade in in dollars. These are really small kind of things at the margin. Um, the U.S. is still the world's supplier of safe assets in the form of U.S. treasuries. To, I mean, to get to the the only thing that I think that would really challenge the U.S. dollar's dominance would be some terrible error of U.S. policy, like a debt default or something like that, which of <laughs> course is also um, in the news at the minute. Right. But I mean, this the, the there are simple ways to think. I mean, there's this 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 story crops up again and again, right? It comes up every five years that all of a sudden the dollar is about to disappear, but it just has these huge. The, one easy way I find to think about it is network effects, right? So. If a Japanese businessman and a Dutch businessman want to trade together, they will probably speak English and they will probably use the US dollar. It's just easy because they know that uh, they can do the same thing with almost anyone else that they um, mm -hmm. that they want to trade with. Um, but I see uh, Albert raised his hand there, so uh, I'll, I'll stop talking. <laughs> okay, no, I, Albert, I, over to you. I, I agree with Jason, of course I do. But um, so you know, one thing I think that uh, was an impetus toward this recent kind of trend towards de-dollarization. Mm -hmm. It was, uh, you know, the suspension of the SWIFT payment system as part of the sanctions against Russia. I think that shocked a lot of observers around the world and maybe made people feel like 
in an un unpredictable geopolitical world, maybe we shouldn't be vulnerable to having everything in dollars. Um, uh, but I agree with Jason. It's very unlikely the dollar will be replaced. And and I want to uh, really defer to my colleague at HKOSD, Edwin Lai, who has written the authoritative book on the internationalization of the RMB, uh, which was published uh, by Cambridge University Press a few years ago. And Edwin's main argument is that, you know, uh, a lot of international transactions are for trade. Uh, and that's where we're seeing the increased use of the renminbi, which, you know, seems fine if you're engaging in a lot of trade with China. In fact, China has some leverage to even demand that of trade partners if if the other countries are really reliant on trade with them. Um, at the same time, most, by far, the huge chunk of transactions internationally are financial transactions, um, mm -hmm. which, you know, buying and selling assets and as long as China's capital account is not opened freely and convertible, it's really inconvenient to hold the renminbi um, for because you want to have you want to hold uh, a, a currency um, because there are many many uses for it, you know, not just right. one. And so right, right. This, and so I think um, China needs to. Uh, really proceed with financial liberalization domestically and then international capital account liberalization before I think it could really gain traction and really uh, increase its share of uh, global, uh, the use of the renminbi as a reserve currency. Okay. So you also think that the US dollar is the, it's not really a de-dollarization. There's stuff happening around <clears throat> the margins, but at the end of the day, you need something for many uses and the dollar is it. Right. Okay. Okay. And then, go ahead, Jason. I mean, there's a, there's a lively debate about whether having a world's reserve currency, the payment reserve currency, is necessarily a good thing for the United States. I mean, the lots of people say it is, of course, and plenty of people will advance very good arguments for why it is. But then there are occasionally people like um, Michael Pettis, for instance, who argues that it's not a good thing because it's it ter can be terribly destabilizing. In a world where places like China and Saudi Arabia are running these enormous export surpluses uh, and have huge sort of national savings and balances and they're plowing everything into US dollars, that creates these big unstable flows of money into the United States. And certainly there are people who argue pretty persuasively that that was one of the big contributions to the 2008 financial crisis. So, uh, you know, having the world reserve currency is nice but there are it comes with downsides as well and so mm -hmm. the idea of a more multipolar world for some people would argue is necessarily a bad one for those reasons mm -hmm. okay okay well wow that's really fascinating thank you um there is one country that i want to go uh i would love for albert you to talk about uh there's an audience question about what is your read on southeast asia especially indonesia especially the tech sector in indonesia so maybe you could talk about Indonesia in general as well as the tech sector there. Well, I think Southeast Asia is probably the mo most robust kind of dynamic economic region in the world. Uh, you know, South Asia is growing fast, but Southeast Asia, you know, some of the countries are a little bit ahead of India. They're now uh, very diverse economies. You know, Philippines with business process outsourcing is, is outsourcing is you know, growing that modern sector pretty quickly. And Indonesia is a very kind of well-managed uh, uh, economy with a pretty pragmatic uh, governance trying to promote uh, development. And the tech sector has done well, especially the digital kind of online uh, mm -hmm. companies. Um, Asia as a whole has been growing its digital trade digital services trade faster than any other region of the world. And this is the fastest growing part of global trade. Uh, so that's all promising. And I think uh, Indonesia is uh, at the at the heart of that. Um, Indonesia has also been very progressive on efforts to uh, address climate change. Uh, so, I, you know, they hosted the G20 presidency last year. Uh, so I think... Uh, I think they're getting more attention and I think, you know, they're a large economy in the region. They're, uh, they, along with India, will be really come important growth uh, poles for, um, for the region as China's growth kind of inevitably 
uh, declines given a variety of uh, structural factors. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So that's some. Um, that's another country that's worth um, looking at more closely going forward. Or there, uh, do you think that the Indonesian economy might um, be more of an engine of growth going forward? I think the combination of their size and their projected growth rates make them very important. I think other economies like Vietnam and Philippines, those are the mm -hmm. two countries that we are projecting uh, higher than 6% growth this year, are also countries to keep an eye on. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, there's a bunch of Jason, questions. Jason, Jason, Jason just, a, just one additional point in Indonesia is, um, uh, is nickel, right? So they have lots of nickel and they've done a very good job of um, kind of uh persuading um uh, companies that mine nickel to process it and refine it in indonesia as well so they're mm -hmm. sort of moving up the value chain you can see this mm -hmm. in advance of payments and so on um, and then of course we are now entering a world where you need lots of nickel to make electric vehicles so uh, to make batteries for electric vehicles to be precise so there are you know, there are other reasons why indonesia might be an interesting place to watch mm -hmm. okay great thank you so but, we've but, had, but that that processing mm -hmm. that processing is uh, you know chinese uh, technology, Chinese companies. Oh, that's true. So it, it's not clear how, <laughs> if that's going to so be. Everything is related. Now. You can't you can't separate but, the two. It, it, yeah, it's Jason's earlier point. It's very hard to really kick China out of the supply chains. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Now we have a bunch of questions from the audience about so, somewhat longer term issues about uh, China and the U.S. So let's start with one of them, which is. How do you see the U.S.-China political tension play out? Is there an end game here? Albert, would you like to take it? Well, that's not really my area of expertise. <laughs> but I was recently in Washington, D.C. for the IMF uh, World Bank spring meetings. And I don't know, it just seemed very, the, the the policy debate seemed to be, you know, who can do be more anti-China than the next guy? So I anticipate this kind of tension to persist for for the foreseeable future. Uh, I, I, I'm not that optimistic about that. I just hope that, um, you know, wiser minds will prevail or, or not wiser, but uh, more moderate positions will prevail and, and moderate uh, the negative impacts of this tension. Um, I actually think Japan has an important play to role as, uh, you know, a, a very valued ally of the US, but a country that also has a lot of economic engagement with China. Mm -hmm possibly be a moderating force. I think other third party countries will certainly weigh in on let's have open multilateral trade. We want to have good relationships with everyone. Um, but I don't think this tension between uh, the two great powers is likely to recede very soon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to be in this for, for a while longer. Um, okay, Jason, over to you. Does Can you talk about the uh, China's demographic issues? the falling population and how that would affect the economy in the long run, in, in the mid to long term. Uh, sure. So but put simply, China has a shrinking working age population. Mm -hmm. And this is happening at a moment in its development where it hasn't really got rich, right? You know, this happened in Japan, but it was all already rich. Uh, whereas China, it's happening kind of in this phase of its development, which is, is not ideal. Um, and there are no, I mean, if you just stick with that demographic thing, there are no obvious solutions in a way. It's not like China seems particularly open to mass immigration, for instance. Um, it's embracing automation in lots of sectors, but that's, I mean, we've been hearing that the robots were coming for years and we're all kind of still waiting in a way, aren't we? Um, so, I mean, that's that's kind of the challenge, you know, there, and this is combining with lots of other structural problems, which Albert was alluding to a moment ago, um, that all suggests that China's sort of peak growth years are all likely to be behind it, and that we're looking at a, um, you know, a decade or two of much weaker growth in China, lower potential growth, lower actual growth, um, and probably some really, you know, pretty serious problems that they need to work out. And of course, then on top of all this, is this uh, growing tension with the United States, which uh, I agree with. I mean, it's it's hard to be optimistic about it, and if anything. You can spot areas where the um, kind of antagonism is likely to widen. I'm thinking just mm. of, in, in terms of economics, in terms of industrial sectors. You know, there's talk about biotech as being the next sort of um, uh, point of contention and that kind of thing. So, so yeah, China has demographics is certainly one big problem. It's not the only one uh, that China is facing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Albert, what do you think? Is demographics one of the big things that um, challenges for China? Are there 
bigger things that China has to worry about in the mid to long term? Well, if you just think about the different components of growth, mm -hmm. you know, the demographics is important. It's definitely a headwind. Um, I would say the one thing that the simple thing that China could do to help a little bit um, is uh, to try to increase its retirement age and create incentives where people can work longer. Because, uh, you know, we've been doing some research on aging in different countries in Asia. And, you know, uh, China's older people are very are, are, are much healthier than in the past and they're capable of working longer. Uh, but we still have very early retirement ages uh, in, in China, especially for women. So that would be one well, what thing. Was it in, what was the retirement? At 55 or something for women? Is it? Or... It's 55 and sometimes 50. Okay. Uh, depending 50. on the sector. Oh, and for that's men, very early. Yeah. 60 and right. So I think um, they've announced uh, the, an intention to raise the retirement age a number of times mm -hmm. in the past. It seems to have been politically difficult to kind of actually move forward with implementation. So hope, hopefully that will happen uh, sooner rather than later. But beyond the aging headwind, you know, uh, you need to increase uh, productivity. You can increase capital investment to raise labor productivity. But I think there's evidence that the returns to capital are, you know, have been diminishing. Uh, it kind of makes sense, right? And productivity too is harder. When you're in a stage of catch-up growth, it's easier to transfer technologies and increase productivity quickly. Um, and also shift resources, labor and other resources from mm. low productivity sectors like agriculture to high productivity sectors like industry. But those easy gains have been exhausted to large parts. So China needs to really be innovative and not just support innovation, but I think um, really support competition, uh, which is really where uh, the private sector thrives, where small and medium enterprises uh, thrive. Uh, Non-state sector growth has been the driver of most of the productivity growth and employment growth in China in the past, but seems to have weakened uh, in recent years. Mm. And so I think that's something that uh, needs to be, uh, con there needs to be conscious policy efforts to restore. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there are a lot of things going on that China has to do um, in order to, I mean, it, it's, the challenge is getting harder and harder, it seems. Is, do you see signs of being it being ready or what, what do you think? How how well, ready to tackle these challenges is China, do you, in your opinion? I I think there's a lot of latent potential in China. Mm -hmm. uh, if you uh, one thing one project I was involved in was uh, at HKOSD was we were doing surveys of manufacturing firms all across the country, well in five provinces in different regions of the country, and if you go visit CEOs in. Shenzhen or in Jiangsu or or in uh, um, Hubei, you know, there's incredible dynamism. There's great firms that are very innovative, um, especially the ones that are really operating in a very globally competitive environment. There's China has achieved quite a lot, so it has a lot of capabilities, but I think it still needs to be put in uh, in a very open, competitive environment to continue to thrive and grow, and especially for the new firms. You know, um, there was a story I read recently about how there were a lot of uh, very competitive high tech firms, very innovative tech firms in China who are now going outside of China to compete mm. uh, because it's so hard in China given the environment. So I think there is this potential still based on the built up. Uh, all of the accomplishments of its industrial development that, you know, they're still at the cutting edge of a lot of technologies and a lot of, uh, uh, in terms of cost, you know, in production, you know, renewable energy, for instance, they're the most cost efficient at producing solar panels. And that's going to be a growth <laughs> industry for a lot of years to come. Mm -hmm. So there are these areas of innovation um, that, that suggest, um, you know, there's still a lot of innovation potential in China. Okay. Okay. Just one, one other industry that springs to mind is electric vehicles, or you know, it, right. It, right. As an example of China's potential, so China is now the largest exporter of passenger cars in the world. Something that seems that, if you look at the chart, seems to have come out of nowhere, and this all happened in the last uh, couple of years. And um, they're they're just streets ahead, it seems, in you know, mass-produced kind of electric vehicles. They're doing very well in things like uh, smartphones and so on. And they, they seem to be a growing share of their exports are going to, um, you know, middle income countries and developing countries where you're, you know, where they make kind of the, the more affordable versions of 
uh, lots of kind of stuff that we that consumers of the West want. So, um, you know, phones, um, electric vehicles, and so on. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. There is a lot of potential there. I mean, one other thing, one of, the one other thing that economists always talk about. We started this conversation by um, talking about Chinese consumption, and um, there needs to be a rebalancing in China towards uh, more consumption as an engine of growth in general, and not just kind of mm. as a short term thing this year. The consumption share of um, GDP in China is low relative to um, lots of so other. So that economies. means consumers aren't spending as much as they should be or can be. Well, that's true in the short term, but it also is it is true at the kind of the aggregate level. There's too much economic activity is uh, in investment and export, and not enough is in consumption. Mm -hmm. um, so, if you look at other economies like, and I'll, I'll tell you a story better than I can, but you know, South Korea or Japan or Taiwan that followed a similar development path of industrializing and then eventually shifting towards uh, more consumption. Uh, hand in hand with this is the market liberalization stuff that is needed to spur greater competition and innovation. And if anything, the signs there are going in the opposite direction, right? We get lots of alarming stuff about uh, tech and, um, you know, crackdowns on one thing or another. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mixed picture. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a, there are lots of questions about China, but I'll go to one more. Uh, Jason, you talked about the property market, and there are lots of stories that you've written about China's property market, but it keeps coming up um, in the news. Where are we in term? you know, where is this issue at the moment, and how likely is it to weigh, the, weigh down the Chinese economy heavily? And that's where are we at the moment? I hope we're somewhere near the bottom, but it's not exactly <laughs> clear. I mean, the uh, you know property and real estate and real estate investment has been you know so important to the Chinese economy for so long. Um, the government is attempting to kind of uh, fix things quite slowly, so it's trying to thread the needle of not um, of keeping property as like an attractive uh, thing for people to to buy and live in and all the rest of it without letting debt out of control, without letting the kind of speculative activity that um, that uh, got so problematic to rear its ugly head again. And it's just, I mean, the the, the kindest way to talk about it is just it's a very slow process. Um, but it has all sorts of knock-on effects. You know, property land sales were the chief source of revenue for local governments in China. They're all horribly indebted and are struggling now to pay their bills. Um, when will it end? I just don't know. I mean, you can see some glimmers of uh, green shoots of the data, some mm -hmm. signs that prices in some places are turning up, some signs that transactions are picking up. Const construction is still very weak, as I re remember last time I looked at the data. So you're seeing that the, the, the buildings are getting finished. If you remember a few months ago, uh, people were moving into apartments that hadn't been finished because the profits had right. the lost all their money. But we're not seeing a lot of new activity. So it's still, it's still nowhere near it being healthy, is the... Mm. I think the simplest way to think about it, and it's not exactly clear to me at any rate when when things will really improve there. Okay, Albert, do you agree with this assessment? Well, I, I think a more charitable way to look at the property market struggles is that, to some extent, it reflects a good intention of the Chinese government to not rely on a very speculative market to drive growth and to try to shift to higher quality growth that's more meaningful than just flooding money into the property sector. And I think one thing that has been accomplished with the extended you know, struggles recently is that it's tamed the speculative fever of individuals to just buy housing with the expectation that the price will double in a few years. Uh, and so that people are looking at housing purchases in a more realistic way. Now, of course, that could come back in the future, but I think it's it in some ways it's it's kind of a setting similar to setting inflationary expectations at reasonable levels, uh, the speculative expectations. Um, and the other thing is, I think, you know, China could turn on the spigots right away if it really wanted to, and pump up this sector. Then they're really trying to avoid that because they actually are trying not to go back to where they started from. So those are good instincts. I think there's still some margin where they can manage this uh, recovery um, uh, if to, you know, avoid, certainly to avoid a collapse, 
uh, but also to reflate it as needed, uh, given a kind of a longer term growth strategy. Uh, so there were a lot of structural problems, so it is painful to unwind those things, mm -hmm. but uh, hopefully it'll lead to a brighter day. Okay, okay. So we are coming to a close here as we wrap up. I want to um, just summarize some of the things that we talked about today. We started off the discussion by talking about um, how much is the Chinese re economy really recovering? Are consumers really going to spend more? But there also seems to be, as we continue the discussion, you know, there are a lot of um, uh, mid to long term issues as well that China needs to think about. Either way, though, the US China tensions are likely to continue. That's what both of you have said. And in the meantime, there's India coming up, but still it has its own issues, um, may not rival, uh, become a rival as a manufacturer to China for the foreseeable future, but trying to get there. There are other countries like Vietnam, Philippines, Indonesia that we should also be looking at. And uh, perhaps the most surprising moribund to un-China, Japan. Um, also a country that we should be looking out. So there's a lot of things that we should be looking at. Um, as Albert says, it sounds like uh, what you're saying is there won't be a recession in Asia. You're, you're looking at 4.8% growth for the economy, but um, lots of sort of flashing warning signals that we nonetheless in the region have to deal with. Now, I want to end by asking each of you What's your biggest nightmare for, you know, in the next year or so? And what is your biggest potential upside surprise? I mean, if this were to happen in the next year, you'd be really, really happy. Albert, start with you. Uh, so I'm actually concerned about, about the banking turmoil in the U.S. Okay. Uh, just because. The slow, uh, the slow moving. Slow moving uh, crisis. I don't yeah. think we're out of the woods yet. Um, cause you know, if you get to something that's a crisis, uh, approaches a crisis and requires lots of interventions by central banks, and you're going to see a lot of capital flight back to safe assets, which means back to the U S, uh, um, treasuries and other safe assets. Um, and so that would create a lot of financial pressure on the region. That's the mm -hmm. one scenario. Okay. The upside, okay. the upside risk is still China. You know, I think, mm -hmm. um, uh, we'll see what happens in the coming months, uh, but if if uh, if the China Chinese consumer eventually comes back with a vengeance, it'll be really positive for the region. Okay, great, thank you. And Jason, what about you? Um, so I'll say Japan for the upside. I mean, um, you know, this they're not quite they're not quite out of this moribund deflationary trap, but I think <laughs> it would be a quite a moment if we started to see data that suggested that they really had in some way turned a corner. I don't know if it's going to happen, to be honest, but uh, nonetheless, there's a lot of, you know, at least would be, um, it would be pretty exciting if it did. Um, and on the downside, I mean, I hate to, I hate to say this, but you know, the, the one, the sad thing that we all do have to keep in mind is the possibility of what is a cold war between the United States and China turning into something oh. more akin to a hot war. And one of the ways in which that could happen is just some terrible accident, right? I mean, this is the kind of thing that um, keeps the planners up at night um, because the communication lines seem to be so dead between you know, the two powers that um, these kind of nasty accidents could happen. So I'm sorry mm -hmm. to end on that miserable note. I, yeah. I think the likelihood of that is probably very low, but nonetheless, it's the kind of thing that in this region at least would be extremely... Mm -hmm. And we didn't talk about that region that much, but... Yes, um, we always have to keep that in mind. Okay, well, thank you both of you to Albert and to Jason for a very lively conversation. And thank you to the audience for attending.